Oh, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, we just had a little bit of a crisis here. So if you look down over in the corner there, right there, it says Charlie Hunter's Reasonably Fine Art Talk. This is not Charlie Hunter's Reasonably Fine Art Talk. This is Benchley Night. And I have no idea at this last minute how I would get rid of that. So anyway, ignore that over there. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Anyway, welcome everyone. Uh, as I say, it is Benchley Night, and what an exciting Benchley Night it is, ladies and gentlemen. What an exciting Benchley Night it is. It is the first one post Thanksgiving. The cats are inside because wood stove is nice. Wood stove is so nice. The thing I want to flog before I get reading some Benchley, though, is my beloved, Ms. Betty Sue, has published the new edition of Work, Play, Every Day. This is her planner and calendar that she does every year. And this new edition is so swell because it is small. And it fits in what you carry around with you. It has a monthly calendar, and then it has week by week calendars. Let me flip to one of those. So you can see a whole week at a time. And then it's got all kinds of prompts for making uh, your life more efficient and more fulfilling. And you should buy one. Just go to workplayeveryday.com, ladies and gentlemen. Just go to workplayeveryday.com and pick yourself up a copy. All right, that's enough flogging of things. Lovely to have you with us, all 19 of you, all 20 of you. Oh, my goodness, I've got a lot to live up to now. Oh, today's beneficiary of the Liberal Snowplowing Do-Gooder Fund, as I said, it, it, it is um, Rocky Home Entertainment Development because I've gotten a little stretched out in my uh, obligations. Uh, we spent $3,000 on updating the um, Bellows Falls Opera House web page, and I am booking the Ray Masuko concert series for 2023 which will require a whole bunch of deposits to the headlining artists. So consequently, the bank balance has gotten a wee bit narrow of late. Um, I just personally donated some money and now I'm looking to all of you, toss a few dollars if you could, toss a few dollars to Rockingham Entertainment Development, ladies and gentlemen. It's so fulfilling, and it does such a world of good to the people of Bellows Falls, Vermont. And we have a few people to thank. We have a few people to thank, ladies and gentlemen. First off, the great, the incomparable, the peripatetic, Terry Edson. <coughs> oh, what a fine new unlit in a can this one is. Our friend Sherry Michelson. <coughs> The incomparable Catherine Fisher, artist extraordinaire. <coughs> Mr. John Wilhelm, out there in Omaha, Nebraska, just eating lobster roll after lobster roll after lobster roll. <coughs> Ms. Sarah Ovenden, down there in Guilford, Vermont, busy planning the 2023 Roots on the Rails trips. We've got some great trips coming up, ladies and gentlemen, some great trips. Not only the rescheduled upon rescheduled upon rescheduled Tom Russell trip across Texas, the waltz across Texas, not only the waltz across Texas, but also the Sarah Ovenden trip to Istanbul. You want to go to Istanbul? Get in touch with Sarah. It's going to be amazing. Also, Scotland and Wales. Wales with the great John Langford. Great 2023 coming up. Great 2023. <coughs> oh, and out there, lastly, out there in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 
out there where the steel mills rust and the new senators get sworn in. My very, 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 very tall cousin, who my Uncle Connie is the son of my Uncle Connie. Uncle Connie departed this world for the next, I think, 12 years ago today. So here's to Uncle Connie, and here's to my very, very tall cousin, Mr. Nat Hunter, and his wonderful wife, Elise. <laughs> Anyway, thank you all so much. So, Benchley Night. This is from the wonderful copy of... Uh, I, I had this book as a soft cover, and it fell apart. And then I was gifted this um, hardcover version by Catherine Fisher uh, of my 10 years in a quandary and how they grew by Robert Benchley. We're going to have two stories tonight because, well, it's only 7.53, even after all this blathering. And if I get done with these two stories by 8 o'clock, I'm going to read three stories. Because a couple of these are kind of short. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, first off today, Robert Benchley's The Icebreaker. Today, I... <laughs> Today I, today I heard a man say to his parrot, roll over, and the parrot rolled over. This sent me to thinking, what would, what would be the first thing you would do if you wanted to make a parrot roll over, short of rolling it over yourself? I can understand possibly teaching a parrot to speak, but how, how would you appro approach the problem of making a parrot roll over? Would you go right up to it and say, roll over, and then wait? I don't quite see the common ground that that could get on the parrot. I don't quite see the common ground that one could get on with a parrot as a starter for such an experiment. There must be some initial move to be made, and I am glad that I am not the one who has to make it. It is these initial moves that get me down. What is the very first thing that someone does when they set out to build a bridge? How do you, de how do you decide where to dig that first shovel full of earth in making a road. On the first day of work, in, in erecting a skyscraper, what is the first move that you would make? I could probably build a bridge or erect a skyscraper or even teach a parrot to roll over if someone would just get the job started for me. But I know perfectly well that if I were handling any one of these enterprises, I would spend the first day gazing into space, trying to figure out how to begin. Fortunately, as yet, no one has come to me with a skyscraper to be erected or a bridge to be built. And as I am in my middle 40s now, it does not look like anyone is going to. Still, you can't ever tell Joseph Conrad did not begin to write until he was 40. Napoleon never even saw a steamboat until he was 58. Mozart never wrote a bar of music until he was 90. Anything can happen, but it usually doesn't. I am still worrying, though, about that parrot. Did, did the parrot come to the man, maybe, and say, teach me to roll over. That, at least, would have broken the ice. Oh, well, I've got better things to do than worry about breaking the ice with the parrot. But right now, I really, I can't think of what they are. That's the first one, ladies and gentlemen. That's the first reading tonight. The second reading tonight Back to Mozart. Some time ago in this space, 
I attempted to cheer up others who, who felt that life was closing in on them with nothing accomplished. So I wrote that Napoleon never saw a steamboat until he was 58, and that Mozart never wrote a bar or music until he was 90. Well, a very pleasant correspondent has written in to ask me if there has not been some mistake. She has always understood, she says, that Mozart died at the age of 35, that he began to compose. And then he began to compose at the age of four. I don't think we're talking about the same Mozart. The Mozart that I meant was Arthur Mozart, who lived, who lived at 138th Street until he died in 1926 at the age of 93. This Mozart that I'm referring to was a journeyman whistler who went about from place to place giving bird calls and just plain whistles. He was a short, dark man with a mustache in which everyone claimed he carried a bird. After his death, this was proved to be a canard. This is not a pun. This is not a pun on the French word for duck. He did not carry a duck in there either. Up until the age of 90, though, Arthur had never composed anything for himself to whistle, always relying on the well-known bird calls and popular airs of the day. That is, they were popular until Arthur gave them a workout. But just before his 90th birthday, the Mozarts got together and they decided that Grandpa Arthur, as they called him, ought to unbelt with a little something for posterity. So they gave him a pitch pipe and they stood around waiting for him to swallow it. But instead of swallowing it, Mozart went into the next room and he worked up a fairly hot little number for woodwinds and grasses called Opus Number One because it was such hard work. It was a steal from Debussy, but the cadenzas were Mozart's. He also went into the coda right after the first six bars. This Arthur Mozart is the one I had referred to in my article. The Mozart that my correspondent refers to was evidently a prodigy of some sort if he composed at age four. He also must have worked on one of the nightclubs one of the nightclub pianos like Harry Richmond's. Maybe it was Harry Richmond. All this shows what comes of not giving initials when you mention a name in print. But how was I to know? <laughs> but how was I to know that there were two Mozarts who were composers? It is 8.01. Oh, that's so close to 7.59, and I did blather. I think we're going to have a third story tonight. Don't you, ladies and gentlemen? Don't you? We're going to be dead. As my friend Don McManus said to me in the year 2000, we're going to be dead a long time, my friend. Frog Farming by Robert Benchley. A warning has gone out from the Conservation Commission against too sanguine investment in frog farms. I am one of the most warnable people alive, but I don't have to be told to look out for frog farms. I know all about them. Mr. McGregor and I started a frog farm on a small scale only last year, but somehow we could not seem to make a go of it. I don't think that Mr. McGregor used the right tactics with the frogs, personally. Having been in the Navy during the war, he was accustomed to being obeyed. You cannot yell, avast, at a frog and expect it to avast, or even to stand at attention. Mr. McGregor was just too gruff with them. Possibly, we did not have the right sort of corral for the frogs. We used the next room. It was nice and light in the next room. And we had pan 
we had pans of water and dog biscuits around everywhere, but the frogs did not seem happy. They never moved around much, except when Mr. McGregor went in to take care of them. The first day that we had the frog farm, McGregor put on a pair of overalls and went in to do the chores. In a minute, he came back out, dispirited. I can't make them hold still, he said in a hurt tone. What do you want them to hold still for, I asked, trying to get at the bottom of the trouble quietly, instead of flying into a panic right at the start. How are you going to bathe a frog if it won't hold still, he asked. Just as I get squatted down, it hops halfway across the room. Maybe you ought to set it up on a table in front of you, I suggested. Then you wouldn't have to squat down. I'd jump halfway across the room myself if you squatted down beside me. Well, no danger of that, he said testily. You think it's fun to chase a frog all around a room with a stool? Here, here, here you sit in this room taking care of the books, as you say. Well, somebody's got to take care of the books if we're going to run a farm scientifically, I replied. Modern farming is not the haphazard thing it was when you were a boy, you know. Well, supposing I take care of the books for a while and you do the chores, said McGregor. He was getting sullen. What have you got to put in the books anyway? We haven't made a sale yet. I'm working up a billhead, I replied very calmly, and I showed him a nicely lettered billhead reading, McGregor and Benchley, Fine Frogs. Is that all you're going to say, just fine frogs, Mr. McGregor asked? What do you want me to say, fine frogs, you bet, or fine frogs for fussy folk? There was a note of exasperation in my voice. I mean, said Mr. McGregor, what kind of fine frogs? What are they for? Fighting, breeding, steeplechasing? This did bring up a question we had not thought of. Just what, just what were our frogs going to be sold for? We could not hope to get along on just the frog's legs market. And practically no one has a pet, has a, has a frog as a pet these days. Let's go into the stables and see what they do best, I suggested. Take off your overalls and put on your puttees and we'll take a look at the stock. On arriving in the next room, however, our problem was solved for us. There were no frogs at all. We looked under the chairs. We looked under the filing cabinet and even out the window, but the frogs had gone. Our bubble had burst. So we dissolved our partnership and went out of business but we do still keep the next room shut off, just in case. All right, ladies and gentlemen, all right. Thank you for joining us for Benchley Night tonight. So good to chat with you all. We'll see you next week. I'm here for several weeks, so we got several Benchley Nights coming up. Maybe we'll throw in a Thurber too. Anyway, you take care. See you next Sunday. This is not the Reasonably Fine Art Talk. Bye-bye.